Uh, Admiral, very nice of you to come out to our studios. Welcome to WNYC. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you very much. President Obama's official nuclear weapons policy for the United States, revised this week, says we will never use nuclear weapons against a non-nuclear nation, even if they attack us with other weapons of mass destruction, so long as they are in compliance with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. What does that change mean for the Navy? Well, I, I think for the Navy, uh, there's quite very little change. Uh, we are one leg of our nation's nuclear triad, and I would say the most survivable leg because it's based on our submarines. And our job is to make sure that that leg of the triad is, is ready. But I do believe uh, that the, the uh, treaty that has been signed is a, is a terrific step uh, in the president's uh, objective of reducing reliance on nuclear weapons and reducing uh, proliferation. So it's, it's really uh, uh, a terrific step forward. The president also announced that no new nuclear weapons would be designed. Good idea? Um, I believe that uh, the reliability of our stockpile is important, and that's where our focus is, is to make sure that uh, the weapons that we have today is, uh, uh, is a stockpile that's reliable, and, and I believe that, that that is a positive step as well. Under the treaty, will you have to supervise dismantling of any nukes under the Navy's control? Um, not directly. Uh, those are handled by different agencies within the government. Uh, my responsibilities really deal with making sure that our submarines and the weapons that we have uh, are ready, that they're safe, and that they're secure. As a matter of policy, I hear the president getting criticized from the left, criticizing from the right, right now on the nuclear posture review. Personally, I can't imagine the U.S. dropping a nuclear bomb on anyone for any reason, even if some rogue country or terrorist dropped a nuclear bomb on us. A nuclear weapon seems to me like a weapon of state terrorism because it would inevitably kill so many civilians and not probably have a military usefulness that couldn't be accomplished in other ways. Should I not view it that way, in your opinion? Well, I believe that the importance of our deterrent uh, is, is significant. It, it has served our nation well for a long time. Uh, and, and the deterrent posture of our nuclear forces is something that, that I take very seriously and, and, and that we maintain in a very high state of readiness and, uh, and security. But I also do believe that deterrence is also a function of our conventional forces. And that's what the Navy does day in and day out in every ocean of the world, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so it's our conventional deterrence that I think is, is important as well. Just to go a step further on this, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were, in, you know, in, in the U.S.'s view, to avoid mass troop casualties when wars were fought that way. Give me a modern scenario, any plausible scenario, no matter how far from it we may be today, under which you could envision the U.S. justifiably using a nuclear weapon? Well, um, Brian, I don't speculate on uh, uh, scenarios where uh, nuclear weapons would be used or would not be used. I think it's important uh, to recognize the, the role that, that our nuclear deterrent plays in, in uh, maintaining a, a peaceful environment in the world that we live in. Uh, and, and, and so to speculate on when it would be used or not used uh, I, I, I just don't go that far. U.S. Chief of Naval Operations, Gary Roughhead, my guest on WNYC. Am I mistaken, by the way, that the chiefs of the other services get chief of staff and you are chief of U.S. Naval Operations? As, as somebody who lived in Norfolk for a few years, you know, that, uh, that strikes me as maybe discrimination against the Navy. Well, I, I, uh, I think it could be the other way around. I, I think the title of chief of Naval Operations is one that uh, – uh, that I am honored to hold and uh, more honored to be able to lead the great young men and women of our Navy. Let's go on to another topic about a non-nuclear cause of mass destruction in our society. I see in the news this week that the Navy is considering banning smoking on submarines, and I was surprised to learn that people could smoke on subs in that kind of enclosed environment. Why is it allowed, and why might you ban it now? Well, I, I think uh, uh, clearly um, we have, as, as a Navy, have uh, tried to dissuade smoking and unhealthy behavior like that, not just on our submarines but throughout our ships. But recently we have conducted some tests uh, on some of our submarines, and because it's such a closed atmosphere 
and even though we filter a lot of uh, the air on the submarine, there are still uh, significant contaminants that we have found that even for those who do not smoke, uh, they are at great risk because of the smoke uh, 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 contaminants that, that remain in the atmosphere. Uh, we have looked at this, and uh, we believe it's in the best interest of those who serve on our submarines uh, to ban the smoking. Clearly, uh, for those who smoke, this is a big deal, uh, but I really do believe it is the right thing to do, and it's uh, in the best interest of the health and safety of our people. I read one piece of speculation that it might be related to allowing Navy women on subs at some time in the future. Some women's advocates, as you know, argue for that inclusion. But a recent study showed that submarine life could be hazardous to fetal development. Any relation between one and the other? No, there really aren't. In fact, uh, as we uh, looked at the service of women on board submarines, that was one of the areas that had been identified in the past. Uh, we have looked at that. My Surgeon General, who is a superb physician, um, has uh, viewed the risks uh, as not significant. That doesn't mean that we're not going to uh, continue to do research on our submarines as far as the health of, of all who serve on board. Uh, but that was something that we looked at very carefully, and I'm confident that it does not pose a risk to the young women who uh, are very much looking forward to serving on board our submarines. So this is something that's going to happen? Women on submarines? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, the young women uh, that have come up to me since we've announced that change in the policy, there's great enthusiasm for me as the Chief of Naval Operations, uh, knowing the great young women that we have serving in the Navy, as a former commanding officer of a ship that mixed the crew, that mixed the genders on a ship, uh, to me uh, it, it would be foolish to not take that great talent, the great competence and intellect uh, of the young women who serve in our Navy today and, and uh, bring that into our submarine force. Don't ask, don't tell. Right. A one-year review is underway. I gather you have been noncommittal so far as to whether you think it could work for the Navy to end Don't Ask, Don't Tell until after the review? I'm very much in favor of uh, doing this review because it will allow us to uh, determine what our Navy believes, what our force believes. There are many comparisons to other navies. Uh, we are not other navies. Our demographic is different. Uh, the way we employ our force is different. And I believe it's important that we understand what the attitudes are of the young men and women who have uh, volunteered to serve uh, in our Navy. So I'm very much in favor of the assessment. Uh, it will inform us, it will inform me, so that I can provide my best military advice. And should Congress uh, change the law, because that's what needs to happen uh, uh, to allow homosexuals to serve in the, in the military, uh, but should Congress change the law, this assessment will also inform us as to the types of things that we need to be uh, thinking about. What are the main questions that you need answered for yourself on that? Well, I think for me, uh, the issue is one of uh, attitudes of uh, men and women in uniform, and, and particularly for me, the Navy. Uh, but there's no question in my mind that it would, if the law were to change today, uh, those who wear this uniform will obey the law. But I want to be able to understand uh, what the views are, the propensity to serve, the propensity to continue to serve uh, as a result of a change that is not insignificant in our military today. So, so that would be very helpful. To so me. take me a step deeper if you can. If Don't Ask were to be repealed, how would you go about that integration process? You, you want to maintain cohesion and morale, and you were just saying recruitment and retention. So if, if that's the decision, what would be the main methods of implementing the change? Well, there'd be uh, no question that if the law were to change that we would move forward. Uh, I think that uh, uh, there would have to be policies that would uh, need to be examined with regard to uh, the... Um, the accommodations that, that, that exist on board our, our ships and submarines. Separate housing? Uh, with regard to um, the benefits that accrue, with regard to some of the domestic laws and how they would apply uh, to a change in, in law uh, as it applies to the military. So I think there are a lot of things like that that would have to change. You, you mean there might be some kind of gay housing? Uh, I would not say uh, that, but I think the, the issues of 
um, the the rights that would uh, accrue to partners and, and things like that are, are areas that uh, that would be worked through. 